my talk today, we heard so much about different concepts. We heard about lifelong learning, about the SDGs just now. We heard about entrepreneurial thinking and a set of competencies. And what I try to do is to put that all in perspective to see how higher education institutions find themselves in the middle of economic, social and political pressures. And I will also try to show what conflicting rationales they need to address. So basically, there are a number of global trends that all higher education institutions are confronted with. These are key realities of the 21st century. We all know that massification and a widening participation impact teaching, research, third mission activities, increase of enrollment, and so on. So that is a fact. The requirements of the global knowledge economy, that's the second thing that all institutions of higher learning are confronted with, which means that knowledgeable people are seen to be a major asset for nations nowadays. So of course, nations have the interest of educate their people to be capable of addressing the pressing needs of the global knowledge economy. That's also a fact. Then we live in the middle of digital transformation. So flexible learning paths, more flexible um, learning, teaching, research, is required. And then, of course, globalization. We heard about intercultural communication, ambiguity tolerance, and all those set of competences that are there. Yet, there are different ideology-driven agendas that you find in the literature. On the one hand, it's an eco economy-driven approach. Then we have the open society-driven approach. And then we have political agendas that throughout the nations are different and depend very much on the stakeholders involved. I'm going to touch now on these different rationales in more detail to point out what is really at stake. We heard a lot about entrepreneurial thinking, innovation skills. We talked about the need for interdisciplinarity and how we might have similar objectives around the world, but how they might be addressed differently will be pointed out now within the next minutes. So one thing that we definitely need to say goodbye to is that Higher education institutions just keep the status quo and just leave it the way it is. So there is no way this can be done. There is a dy dynamic emergence of new players, of new realities, of new stakeholders, of new student populations. We cannot turn a blind eye to that. That's a fact. The same goes for higher education, was reserved to the elites only, right? But given the massification, given the pressures of the, as I just pointed out, um, global knowledge society, there is no longer uh, the possibility to leave it this way. And the same goes for intensive specialization. In former times, it was great to have this eye-shaped skill set, right? The deeper you dug down, the more you were an expert. The global problems of today can no longer be solved by intensive specialization alone. So what has to be done is interdisciplinary T-shaped skills, transversal skills need to be added to experts, and that is also a key factor that universities need to address. So, what about the different pressures? The first one are economic pressures. Economic pressures, you know, formally it was all clear that peer recognition, thriving for excellence, elite student population, and of course elite um, academics that were doing research on an island. But more and more commercial interests actually became a fundamental threat to the values of, if you want to call it, Humboldtian universities. More and more Around the world, also in Europe now, entrepreneurial universities emerge that are very much under financial pressures, where graduate employability is put forward, where industry university connections are institutionalized and standardized, and the growing financial pressure 
cries for accountability, graduate employability, and all concepts that go around. That is no longer the case. Um, also in Europe, in Europe, Cambodian universities seem to more and more shift, uh, it seems to be an organizational shift, towards financial pressures, towards this outcry of industry to produce graduate employees or to produce graduates that are fit for the labor market and are needed so badly by industry, given again the global knowledge economy. Then we have social pressures. You talked about SDGs and so on. They are called in the literature nowadays the grand challenges. The grand challenges, you call it, you can say it, it's poverty, clean water, climate action, gender equality, or for higher education institutions, it's education for all. The grand challenges, the 70 SDGs, this, um, they are uh, they were implemented in uh, 2015 as a global action plan by UNO, and they are the sustain sustainable de development goals that need to be addressed by 2030. So that's not so long, that's not so far ahead. In order to address these grand challenges, um, it becomes obvious and very clear that interdisciplinary cooperation needs to be done. You need to address these grand challenges in concerted, in globalized, in democratic action. So there is the pressure from industry now as well as um, University 4.0, that's um, a, a concept that Libert coined saying that more and more university has to go away from this disciplinary thinking going deep down to the eye shape, as I pointed out, but actually being capable of educating people to be interdisciplinary, collaborative thinkers that can make um, that, that can look at a meter level analysis and can make a cohesive whole of it all. So also, industry now says that it's important to have a close cooperation. So the third mission activities of universities, the first mission is teaching, the second mission is research, and the third mission is leaving an impact, leaving a social impact. Universities just need to address the grand challenges together with society, together with all kinds of stakeholders involved. Lifelong learning, an issue that we heard already, it's all about global citizens citizenship, open society, people need to open up and need to be prepared for the challenges of the globalized world. So there is no need, you can't just stay in one company forever and just be happily working there forever. You have to be flexible, capable of addressing different issues and so on. That brings me now to this nice quote of Steve Jobs, who basically said that, that technology married with liberal arts, married with the humanities, yield us the results that make our hearts sing. Steve Jobs under, understood perfectly well, it's great to be you know, a technical person and knowing how to program, but you need to have all these transversal capacities to sell it, storytelling, to engage the limbic system, so to work together with other disciplines to address that correctly. I think that is the, the major challenge involved. That brings me now to the political pressures that a higher education institution face. Of course, there are all kinds of conflicting interests and tensions and complex global, domestic, whatever uh, pressures you all name it. We all uh, come from different states that have different interests, that have different governments, so there is no doubt about that. But one thing that we see as a global shift is that universities now get more and more in line with new public management and Managerialism. So the rhetoric of marketization leads to more political control, there are budget constraints. You find that all over the world now, competition, industrial ties, so again, Humboldt is nice, but it's not taken seriously anymore. Political pressures very often come into play. Accountability, restricted budget allocation. Of course, you know, with research, you can very easily make sure what you want the people to um, address and so on. So 
a, a huge dichotomy can be found between, on the one hand, excellence initiatives, so more and more universities of course want to strive and want to point out ranking issues are there, where, versus on the other hand you have this huge demand of massification, so we have to educate more and more people and there is this dichotomy that is very difficult, I think that is one of the main, major challenges that higher education institutions nowadays have to, to address. Um, I would like to have a quick look at the European higher education landscape, given that I come from this um, continent. So there is no doubt that it's the most diversified and most integrated at the same time, which seems to be a bit of a dichotomy, but I'm going to point it out. There, is the, there has been a Bologna process uh, in place for quite some time, 20 years now. And there are numerous Erasmus initiatives, you have Horizon 2020 and so on. The biggest challenge for the higher education European area is to fully integrate this hugely complex and diversified and higher education landscape. We have on the one hand the most prestigious universities, you name them, be it Cambridge or Oxford or so on. And then we have a lot of young, less advanced and at a lesser level of maturity universities and how to put them together, they are often very over-regulated and is getting very rigid. At the same time, uh, Europe wants to unify and have a system that kind of is um, egalitarian if you want to. That leads to a number of paradoxical developments. On the one hand, you have the knowledge economy. The knowledge economy, as I pointed out, wants human capital as an enabler for economic growth, meaning they want to stimulate massification, social mobility. We have in Austria, we just finished a social dimension um, strategic program of the ministry. So we wanted to open up for non-traditional students and Europe all over the place wants to open up university access. So that is the one thing. The other thing is higher education institutions are more and more seen as transversal problem solvers. It is said that if higher education institutions cannot solve their complex problems of today, what are they here for? So on the one hand, we should educate thousands and thousands of students. On the other hand, we should be complex problem solvers and think along these terms, which already is a bit of a dichotomy. And then, the third phenomenon, you have the Europeanization phenomenon, which means that um, the European Union or Europe as such is concerned with, very much concerned with its innovative capacity. Uh, very often Europeans have the feeling that they might not be as innovative as Americans, that the economic and scientific competitiveness needs to be spurred even more. So a number of intergovernmental policy coordinations like the one of Bologna was launched to have this Europe Europeanization ph phenomenon, to be competitive against global forces around the world. So that of course means, and I think the panel was called a paradigm for higher education institution, I don't think that there can be one paradigm, there are many. That brings me to the Latin American lens. Um, I was browsing the literature and basically what I was this attracting from it is there are four trends in Latin America going on. The one is the clear massification trend. So as I said, as I pointed out globally, from small elite to increased access that also hits Latin America and is there and historically um, reserved elite education seems to be over. The second one is the privatization sector. No other um, part in the world has so many private universities, so post-secondary providers, as Latin America has. So what I found in the literature was that there, given the constant growth at a faster pace than everywhere else, strengths and efforts to regulate these sectors seem to be um, on a high political agenda. Then, of course, that brings diversification. You, you also, in Latin America, seem to have the widest range of programs, be it short cycle to PhD, so there is no other part in the world having so many different types of universities, higher education, learning institutions, whatsoever, you name it. And this, the fourth issue that seems to really drive your region is accreditation. 
So what I found is there is a huge attempt to build with different levels of solidity, of course, systems of accreditation and quality assurance that allows for coordinated management of a more and more heterogeneous institution landscape, if you want. So basically, general agreement is there that established accreditation regimes have the potential to institutionalize permanent procedures for quality, quality assurance, and also, of course, improve internal processes. So here the question, is it really that one new paradigm in education is required? I don't think so. I think there is a paradigm shift, but it does not go in one direction. It's not a linear procession. It's really um, a paradigm shift between political interests, economic interests, social societal uh, interests that need to be taken into account, and that is really difficult. So. UNESCO, and that already is nearly 10 years ago, said that higher education institution um, has a change that is unprecedented in scope and diversity. And I think this is true and it's going quicker and quicker and people really, higher education institutions need to adapt very, very uh, quickly to that in order not to um, stand behind, in order to be capable of even standing out. So. Um, being aware, of course, that the aims and goals of higher education might be diverse and the composition of the student population as well. But as I pointed out at the, at the beginning, there are specific trends globally that, are, that we all have to deal with. We all touch them. Um, the most important thing is that each institution, and that's the last line here, needs to find its individual legitimacy. So being aware, what is our mission, what is our profile, where do we want to, to go, and can that be embedded in our political system? I think that is the uh, most important um, uh, message. We, we heard that already, I think, yesterday <laughs> and today. But I think, um, given that this quote is used so often, it seems to be really um, yeah, a good quote to actually illuminate that we really have to think differently. We cannot stick to this kind of thinking we have been, um, I don't know, socialized for such a long time. We have to uh, open up here. So therefore, I would suggest we head for new shores, and I thank you very much for your attention.